first reading this morning is from the seventh chapter of Amos. It can be found on page 750 of your Hebrew Bible. But we'll be starting the seventh verse. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by the wall that had been built true to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, he replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line amongst my people, Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed, and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah, a priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, the king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out of here. You see her? Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do, not do your prophesying there. Do not prophesy anymore in Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temples of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd. And I also took care of the sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from the tending of the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalmody this morning is Psalm 85. It can be found on page 477. I will read the odd verses if you will please respond to the evening. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, our Savior, and put away your displeasure towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I my most beloved God, the Lord says, He promises to his people his faithful service, but let's make now turn to God. Surely his salvation is near, those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed make our Savior, and our land will yield to our service. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Praise be to God. The second reading this morning is from the first chapter of Ephesians. It can be found on page 946 in your pew Bible. This is praise for spiritual blessings in Christ. Starting with the third verse. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship, through Jesus Christ, and according with the pleasures and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one that he loved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all the wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be into effect when the time reaches their fulfillment. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we are also chosen, 
having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. To the praise of his glory, the word of the Lord. Our gospel this morning comes to us from Mark in the sixth chapter. Now I'm actually going back a little bit. Uh, last week I I skipped part of the, the gospel because I want to use it this week. So I'll be starting in Mark 6. Uh, we were reading uh, 7 through 13 and then 14 through 29. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were the instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached and that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist had been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet like the one the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given the orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I will give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you, up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl, girl hurried into the king with a request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went and beheaded John in the prison and brought it back to back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of our Lord. Ah, grace and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I said, I skipped part of last week's gospel reading. You know, I do that sometimes. You probably caught me. But I didn't think it fit, fit into last week's message as well as it would today. I apologize for those that were looking at me going, excuse me, Pastor, you, you stopped too soon. But, you know, the spirit moves me. You know that. Now, the theme of our, our message last week was 
that Jesus was dishonored by his closest friends and family. Because of their personal opinions, they were offended by his wisdom. But the thing I like is it didn't stop him yet. They told us last week Jesus journeyed on to other villages around him. So that brings us into this morning. Mark 6, verse 7. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. Now, the two by two theory is debated over and over. And I truly believe one of the reasons that Jesus sent them out two by two was kind of the witness factor. Each man saw the other performing miracles. Each man had someone to confide in about what was happening. It gave them a peace of mind. It gave them strength. See, we need that in our lives too. When we see great things that God is doing, we need somebody that we can go to and say, you won't believe what the Lord just did. Because if we don't have that second person to talk to about it, well, believe it or not, Satan will take that moment and try to convince you that oh, you did that on your own. That had nothing to do with God. But when we have a witness beside us that understands like we do, it gives us power and strength. So we go on to verse 13. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. As I said, it was real. They were performing miracles through the power that God had given them. In verse 14, it tells us King Herod heard about this. For Jesus' name became, become, had become well known. Now, Herod Antipas, we like to, to, you have to verify who it is because there are a lot of Herods in the world. Herod Antipas was aware of Jesus and the disciples. Herod, that was the Herod in charge at that time. He knew Jesus was doing amazing things and doing them through common men. And it was causing him great anxiety. But of course, as we read on, we have the wrong opinions. Remember those opinions? We have many wrong opinions from people who really had no clue. 14 B through 16, some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. And that is why the miraculous powers are working. Others said, he is Elijah. But still others claimed he is a prophet like the prophets from long ago. But Herod heard this, and he said, John, who might be headed, has been raised from the dead. Herod was sure he was in deep trouble, wasn't he? I mean, they had a lot of superstitious thoughts in the, in the old Roman Empire. But Herod knew he had done many sinful things. And this one might be the one that was going to get him. And he had to think about it. It started from his own sin of lust of the flesh. <coughs> and then following the direction of someone with an impure heart. You know, I talked about impure spirits a few months ago. We, we have impure spirits that cause us to do things we shouldn't do. Some people have more, some people have less. That's why we need Jesus and the Spirit in us to con control that. And here we see it very plainly. Now, a little more about Herod. See, he had a lifetime of, of, of major sin. I mean, he was almost a professional, if you want to call it that. He had married his brother's wife, who was actually his own niece. See, most don't realize the depth of the story that, that John knew. A little history. Herod Antipas had 
known Philip's wife, Herodias, since he was a child. She was the daughter of one of his oldest brothers, Aristobulus. And they were actually about five years apart in age. The story goes after Herod the Great killed Herodias' father, Aristobulus, and his brother Alexander. He espoused each of Aristobulus' orphans to a member of the larger family. In other words, he adopted out or gave them in marriage. And Herodias was to marry Philip, who was actually her uncle. See, Herod the Great had married at least 10 wives and continued to have children for over 50 years. Think of that. See, that's why there was so much incestuous activity in the, in the, in the hierarchy at that time. They wanted to keep it all in the family. They wanted to keep the bloodlines in their own family. So Philip was his wife Herodias' uncle, and Herod Antipas was also her uncle. I mean, if you want to go get right down to it. So when Antipas visited his brother in Rome in 26 AD when he and Herodias supposedly fell in love, it was actually a family reunion. Half brother to half brother, niece, Herodias to Uncle Herod, Herod of Antipas. And in Salome's case, Herodias' daughter, it was actually great uncle Antipas that had come to visit. So that's why John the Baptist was so so focused, so upset, if you will. That's why he called Herod out on his evil doings. The disregard for the sanctity of marriage and family was more than John the Baptist could stand for. The respect for God's plans had been tossed away from the for the fulfillment of someone's lustful desires. And you think about that. Lust of the flesh is still one of Satan's biggest tools he uses in our world today, isn't it? So verse 19, Herodias, Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to. So here's where a large part of the story comes in. We have Herod, a man so controlled by the sinful nature in him and around him that he wouldn't stand up for what was good, would he? But in this case, with John the Baptist, the Spirit of God was working in him. See, even in the most evil places, the Holy Spirit is working. Never forget that. He's trying to change hearts. He's trying to bring people around. But it's up to that person to accept it. Even if, Her even if Herodias, his wife, wanted to kill John the Baptist, Herod wouldn't allow it. Verse 20, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled Yet he liked to listen to him. That's kind of a major struggle in our world, isn't it? When people hear the gospel, they're puzzled. It's like, what? What are you saying? But they want to hear it. They want to hear it more. Until their impure spirits drive them away and say, don't listen to that. No, 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 you don't want to hear that. And they get back into the into the left brain where we can follow the sin. You know, we hear them words of truth and they fill our hearts. But the world keeps telling us that's nothing, that's a story, that's silly. And we become confused some way. It goes on and on. It has been going on for years. Here we have Herod, a man of great power but a slave to sin and lustful thoughts. Kind of like our confession. We are slaves to sin and cannot free ourselves. 
See, he was trying to walk a fine line between living what he knew was right and living what he wanted. Can you imagine his thoughts? I know John the Baptist is right. He's a man from God. But I don't want to set the people around me. I'll look like, I'll look like a fool. I'll look weird. I'll look strange to everybody around me. How do I live in both worlds? And he did exactly what a lot of people today do. He tried to ignore the whole thing. We just try to get to the next day. Faith, oh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll get that later. Yeah, yeah, I'll, we'll just ignore it now. We'll go there tomorrow. No, instead of holding on to Jesus, we just kind of let him go and put him in the back burner. Well, Herod said, Herod said, party on too. You know? And in verses 21 through 23, the name of my, my story, is my message this morning. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and all his enemies. The king said to the girl, ask him for anything you want, I'll give it to you. And he promised her with it all, whatever you ask for, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Think of that. The power of the sin of flesh. Here we have the most powerful man in the kingdom. Got so frustrated and excited in such a place that he... He couldn't even comprehend what he was doing. I mean, he was in such a daze that he gave up half his kingdom. Think about that. Think of how, sin, how powerful sin is. And it's always waiting to devour us. As I said, the opportune time. We heard that exact line before. When Luke, in Luke, when Satan was done tempting Jesus, and he couldn't win. Luke 4, 13. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. An opportune time. We have to remember, Satan never gives up the war. He never had a chance with Jesus. So he decides to take on the lower people, us. He says, yeah, I can't take down the general, but I can take, his, I can take out his troops one by one. He has a lot better odds with us, but that's why we need to keep Jesus in our hearts and in our sides all the time. Think about that. The opportunity time came. So finishing up verses 24 to 29, she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. Ask him to give the head of John the Baptist on a platter. How evil, how sinful, how, how impure can you be? And then you think about it. Here's Herod, the king. He could have said, no, 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 no. But he had already made that, he had already taken that step into that dark place. The king was distressed because of his oaths and his dinner guests. He did not want to refuse her. Wow. How much closer the world can we get? The king was greatly distressed, but because of, his, because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. The king was broken hearted, but he didn't want to lose face in the people around him. As I said before, our world 
is just a continuous history of our Bible. I look at people in our world, we, because of foolish promises and pride in front of others, we leave faith behind, don't we? We ignore the Spirit and make bad decisions. It's so prevalent in our world right now that people will will literally do the wrong thing because they told the guy beside him, oh yeah, that's what we're going to do. Instead of turning around and saying, no, that's it, I'm done. I can't do this. Instead of letting Jesus guide their hearts, they'll actually take that step into the abyss. No, we can't do this life without Jesus. We can't do this life without the Holy Spirit. Opportune times for Satan come in large numbers in our world. We can't stop them, but we can fight them. That's something you always have to remember. None of us here will ever stop Satan. That's Jesus' job. But we've got to fight him. We've got to fight him to the nail. We've got to listen to God's words. We've got to listen to Jesus. We've got to listen to the Spirit in our hearts. We've got to teach it to our children. But more importantly, we've got to teach it to a generation that has lost the fact of teaching it to their children. We have a big, a big job ahead of us. We look at our scripture, the Herod family lived a life of, of sin and lust and And the problem is it looked pretty big to those lost souls around them. So many thought, whoa, that's cool. I want to live like that. Look at what they do. Sound familiar? But you know what? There's something I can guarantee you. When eternity comes, their dying soul is going to say, I want to live like the Herods. I want to do this what they're doing. I guarantee you, Jesus ain't going to put up with it there. Jesus tells us, you either follow me or there's a life of sulfur waiting for you. It's pretty simple how our, how our history is, how our history goes. And this book right here, the, the main thing throughout this whole book is the people that kept their eyes on the Lord. The first half, they kept their eyes on God. The second half, they kept their eyes on Jesus. But either way, they kept their eyes on their faith. And when the world was doing all their crazy, silly things that so many were following and the crowds got bigger on the wrong side, those that stayed strong with the Lord came out of heaven. No, eternal, eternity will be amazing if we stay strong now. The opportune times for Satan, they're all around us, and they're always going to be happening. But Jesus says, follow me, and I'll get you through. John the Baptist stood up for everything. He says, I'll lose my life to prove a point. Jesus says, all I want you guys to do is to follow me and continually keep me in your heart. And others will follow you back. As it says, he sent out 12, two by two. You need somebody in your life you can go to and say, wow, did you see what the Lord did to me? Did you see what the Lord did for me today? And that person will go to somebody else, and that person will go to somebody else, and then it'll spread. From 12 to, I'm not sure how many million Christians is in the world today. We can't even do the math. How one plus one plus one added up to how many million. God can, though. That was his plan. 
Oh, I say, well, let's pray. Father Jesus, it is so hard sometimes when we we live in a world of, of majority rules, and sometimes the majority seems so evil. But the Herods had the same thing. The majority had the power. And the majority were evil. But Jesus, you show people that you don't have to live that way. <coughs> we'll always have those fights with Satan. You know that. You've warned us many times that he will attack when we're not looking. So Jesus, we ask you now just to fill our hearts with your courage and your power. Keep our opinions focused on you. And take our opinions away and just give us your wisdom. Because then we'll be just absolute winners with you in eternity. Oh, uh, Lord. Thank you for being our, our shepherd. Thank you for keeping us lost sheep going in the right direction. Oh, uh, Jesus, we just pray this all in your holy, holy name. Let us now say prayers for our people. Prayers for those who are us. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, you, you look down on your creation. You look down with love. But we know there has to be con this confusion. Why we won't listen. Dear Heavenly Father, you made us perfect. You made us. You made us. Made us to have a wonderful life here on earth. Continue to watch over us. Continue to bless us with your gifts. Continue to bless us with your bounty. Help us to understand where it comes from. Dear Heavenly Father, never leave us, even when we stumble. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father Jesus, as our last song said, you you set your crown aside and you left your kingdom of heaven and came to earth to show us the way. Dear Jesus, you lived through the times like this morning with Herod executing your cousin, John. Dear Jesus, you could have had a fit of outrage and destroyed things then. But through your love and through your continued kindness and patience, you knew that there were people that didn't feel the same way and you were here to guide. Lord Jesus, as we live in our world and we, we get disgusted and we get outraged by watching people in our world do things that are so wrong. Help us to understand like you did. That at the moment they're take, taken over by evil, the evil spirits, the evil, evil sinful lusts in them, drive them to do terrible things. But as with you, you said we have to have patience to bring them back. Oh, Lord Jesus, teach us that patience. Teach us that guidance. Because we have so many to bring back before that final day. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and showing us the way. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And by the Holy Spirit, we read how you were at work in Herod's heart, in the, one of the most evil men of that time, but you were there working on him. But he suppressed you. Holy Spirit, we know you're in all of our hearts. Help us to show others to the joy of letting you take over. Help us to show others how, how great it will be. Holy Spirit, I ask you to be in the hearts of, of those in our congregation that are sick. Be with the cult family as as she continues to deal with her 
with her sickness. Lord, Holy Spirit, I just ask you to ask you to be in the Ackley family. Be with all those that have lost loved ones in the last few weeks that are just lost now, not knowing which way to go. Fill them up like an explosion of fireworks in their hearts so they can see and hear you and understand which way to go. Oh God, our trying God, we just we thank you for being our God and we just ask you to continue to guide us in our lives and give us strength. And we just pray this all in the one who came and gave us all. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.